I'm presenting. Can you guys see that at the back? No? Okay. While nothing is working, I'll say hi. So my name is Simon Rogers. I am the data editor at the Google News Lab. Um, I've obviously disconnected something important, so we'll just talk for a little bit. Um, I do a job that um, my parents don't really understand what I do, so I'll try, but I will try and explain it to you. So the idea of today's session, I was told that I was to talk about the tools that we're doing. So what I thought I would do is talk about uh, the work that we're doing with data journalism, some of the tools we're working on, and um, yeah, and data journalism. Does that sound all right? And then, and then what we can do at the end is we can take some questions, and then we'll go from there. So yeah, I work for the Google News Lab as part of the Google News Initiative. This is really not working. Okay, I'm going to reload it, and we'll go from there. All right, we'll give that a go, and we'll see what happens. Okay, so I work for the, uh, the Google News Lab, which is part of the Google News Initiative. And um, what the Google News Lab does is like a bridge between Google and the world of journalism. And um, partly that's because Google is this huge company, size of a small city, and um, for journalists often it's kind of difficult to get into. But also for us, we want to be a place inside Google that speaks up for journalism and helps journalists get the stuff that they need. We have people all over the world in lots of different places um, working with the news industry. And um, we, uh, we focus on these kind of big areas of trust and misinformation, local news reporting, inclusive journalism, and emerging technologies. And my bit is really around data. So I run this small team uh, within the News Lab, which basically is a team of kind of young data journalists, people at the beginning of their careers. And what we do is, it's kind of, I'm going to show you some of this stuff because it's a bit easier, but really we create content around Google data. We work on trying to explain it to the world, but we also help new, the news industry out there get hold of some of that data and make it easier for people to, to use and get hold of. So I'm always asked this, so I thought I would just kind of jump to it straight away, like why would, why would uh, Google care about data journalism and why would uh, Google employ a data journalist? So, of course, this is, can I get a clicker, please? So, um, first thing to say is that data journalism, as you know from today and from these events here, data journalism is now mainstream. When we started the data blog back at The Guardian in 2009, there weren't that many organizations who were doing this stuff, but now it's everywhere. So I'm director of the Data Journalism Awards, and we had hundreds of entries this year. And we did a survey last year which found that half of all newsrooms now have a dedicated data journalist. And it's not just in the US or the UK, or even mainstream Europe, it's happening kind of around the world, where you've got like, Basically, most of digital newsrooms, which now all newsrooms, have a dedicated data journalist, journalist or a data journalism team. Thank you. And we saw that with the entries for the Data Journalism Awards this year. We had 630 entries. I'm the director of the awards, so I've just been going through the shortlist, and we're going to announce the shortlist tomorrow. But it's incredible going through this list now. It was the time when we first started it. There were all the entries were from the US in the past, they're all from UK and so on, but now they're from all over the world, and half of them, over half of them are from small newsrooms. Often people would say to me, data journalism, isn't that really expensive? How can we afford to do it? Now everybody's doing it. It's not something that just belongs to the big news organizations anymore. Um, and you know, 57 countries, 330 news organizations, it's very, very much a mainstream thing. So why does Google care about all of this? Well, I guess, you know, Google's kind of been around with data journalism for a while. We have a ton of kind of legacy tools, things that people use, fusion tables, mapping. Google spreadsheets are pretty much the back end for half of the interactives that you see online now. So these are tools that people use every day. But also, the world of data journalism is changing. And even though there are more and more people doing it, there are also more and more challenges to working with data. And so we've been thinking a lot about what those challenges are, something I think about a lot. I'm thinking about what can I do to help that? What can I do to meaningfully 
make that better. The first thing we tried to do is make access to key data easier. So for Google, that really means access to Google search data, Google Trends. Now, for a company that people associate with data, not a lot of people know what Google data is. So I'm going to take a little detour and show you kind of what, how I understand Google data work and the kind of data that we work with. So the first thing to say about Google data is there's a lot of it. Billions of searches every day. It's an incredibly kind of unique data set that takes you beyond the echo chamber of social media. It's something that's just out there. I made this map of these are cities around the world where we could theoretically get data from. So we can get data globally for the whole world, get data for a country, for a region, even for a city, but we can't go any lower than that. So I cannot tell you what your mother is searching for, but I can tell you what the town is searching for where they live. And those towns are amazing. It's like, this is a map, I made this in Carto, um, which is something you all use, and I took away the boundaries. So there are no, there's no map here, it's just a, a map of dots, essentially. And you can see how it reflects where people are, reflects the natural contours of our lives. And that's the way that we search, right? This is something that's kind of ever-present in what we do. It goes down to kind of that level. There's also an honesty to search data, which is really powerful. You know, you're never as honest as you are with your search engine. So this is something that I made um, around the way people search for gun shop in America versus gun control. The idea being search gun, buying guns or controlling them. And you see how it changes after major events. So the average is that people are more likely to search for buying guns in America than for controlling them, except for after big shooting events, and except for in Kentucky, where people always search for buying guns, <laughs> it turns out. But you can use that data to kind of get at changing attitudes. So this is something we did with the Washington Post, and they were looking at searches for same-sex marriage over time. So we picked out the top 10 searches around um, same-sex marriage going back to 2004 and could uh, show it annually. And you can see that, and then we categorized them. They're categorized with the Washington Post into neutral, i.e. informational, people asking for, you know, how do I get a marriage license? Positive, being people actively, you know, proposing same-sex marriage. And negative, people, you know, searching for anti and to search and so on. And you can see how in 2004, love states were pretty negative and how that shifted. You know, our attitudes change over time and search is a really good way to get to that. And partly that's because of that honesty thing. The honesty really reflects in other moments that you find that happen when, when things show up. So this was, these are searches for the, the phrase move to Canada. And that there is Super Tuesday in 2016 when uh, Donald Trump won in seven states. So you can see how, how things happen, and then search data will reflect changes for it. We've used this in a number of ways recently. This is something we did a couple of weeks ago, and this is with new data, which showed not necessarily just where people were searching for, but where people were actually visiting. So the restaurants that people were going for. So you've got this amazing kind of food maps of the US, seeing people, where people search for pizza, or where people search for coffee, or visited restaurant types. This is a new data set we started working with. And part of our job is really, within the news lab, is to try and surface this data and make it easier for people to use and to open it up. I really think there's a responsibility to, for us to be as open as possible and to get the data out there and into the hands of people who can do interesting things with them. There's a lot of interesting stuff about this data around the way that people ask questions. We've noticed a real increase in people asking, almost like conversationally, how do I do something? What, what is this? How does this work? But you can also reflect kind of national differences. So, for instance, these are the top ten questions, of, uh, sorry, top five questions of last year in Italy on pizza. And they feel to me they're quite informed. How to make a good pizza? Who invented it? Is pizza our thing? What does gourmet pizza mean? How to make pizza like in a pizzeria? pizzeria. Um, in the US, it turns out the questions are quite different, which is <laughs> how many slices in a large pizza? How many calories? Where did pizza originate? How much to tip the pizza delivery guy? Which I can tell you, living in this America, this is a big thing. Um, how, but this, this, I feel this is maybe West Coast, how to make cauliflower pizza crust, which feels wrong on many, many levels. But you can see how it's different, right? And it's different in different countries, and it reflects how the world is different, right? We, you know, we're not all the same. We don't search things in the same way. We search for things in different ways. I was told to speak slowly. Am I speaking too fast? Is it okay? All right, I'll try and slow down a little bit. But you can do other things too. So this map shows searches for croissant and searches for donut. I'd like you to guess which color represents 
represents croissant, which color represents donuts. So you can really get a sense of who we are as people from the way that people search. It's kind of an incredibly powerful thing. Most of these things you can do on the Google Trends website, and you can download that data as CSVs. The other thing about the data, which I wasn't expecting, is how immediate it is. As soon as something happens in the world, we want to search, we want to find out what's going on. And we, we often see this with live events. We can see during a debate, or during a football match, or during an election campaign, something happens and it changes the way that people search. And so we, this is something we made um, with a designer called Anna Vital. I hope you can see it all right. I know there's a way to bring the lights down a little bit here. But this was looking at searches after the big Paris attacks a couple of years ago. We wanted to see how quickly, how long it took before people started searching in other countries around the globe for those events. And it turns out, and this is maybe not a surprise, that people start searching within moments, that the news can travel around the world and get to Sydney or you know, uh, Thailand or Madrid or Toronto or San Francisco within Within minutes, people are searching because they've heard about it and they want to know about it. It doesn't matter what time of day it is. Because search is made of this, this global community, and we know how fast information and, I guess, misinformation can spread around the globe. But you can see those kind of changing attitudes in lots of other data, too. So this was in Election Day 2016. And often what we do is we look at how to refine the searches we're looking for. So three years ago, we didn't have real-time search data in Google Trends. It was all three days old. And then we got real-time data, which means it's three minutes old. So instead of knowing what happened three days ago, we know, now know what happened three minutes ago. But what we found is that the data can sometimes be messy. So if you just search for Trump versus Clinton, for instance, you've got all the noise that associates around Donald Trump, so he kind of permeates into the search and makes it hard to work out what's going on. But if you add terms like vote Clinton versus vote Trump, it's like the gunshot versus gun control thing. You can really see how on election day things side spread out and how they kind of match the polling right up until the last minute. So because this data is new, we're always thinking about how to get the best kind of understanding about it. We also think a lot about other things you can do with the data. So one of the things that's particularly useful is this thing of related searches. So if you search for one thing, what else do you search for? So we did this during the primary campaign in the 2016 election. It was looking for all the candidates and who the other candidates were that people searched in order. I guess the point of this was, if somebody dropped out, where would that search interest go? Who would care about somebody else? So we just started looking at this data, and there's some other interesting stuff we found, which, for instance, uh, in counties that, vote, that expressed a lot of search interest in, say, Ted Cruz, they were very interested in the oil industry also, and guns and Chevy trucks, which is maybe not a surprise. In counties that searched for Donald Trump, people were searching for kids' activities and minivans and gaming consoles. Right? It's a different world. He won because of suburban parents. Right? And you can see that in the way that people search, which is an incredibly power powerful thing. So we, we also try and showcase other data too. These are YouTube views by county during the election campaign for each candidate's videos, the official videos of each candidate. And what's interesting to me about this is you can see near the end of the campaign how certain states went red. And anybody who knows anything about American politics will tell you, right? It's Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Florida. These are key states, and these states went red in the way that people were watching videos. This is an indicator, right? All these things are indicators. People often say, oh, is it predictive? And I don't know if search data is predictive or not. However, it is a really powerful social signal. It's not a replacement for polling or anything like that, but it is a powerful social signal. It doesn't not mean anything. It means something. We just don't know what that something is yet. So to give you a sense of the way people search, uh, I wanted to look at the kind of the way people search in Italy. So, so this is, these are searches in Italy. And when I started this job, we were always looking for something that would be a constant in search, something that would give us a reference point for other searches. And that something was Kim Kardashian. Turns out a lot of people search Kim Kardashian. Maybe not a surprise. But things have changed a little bit. And actually, there is another person who is more searched even than Kim Kardashian. This is Italy, by the way, in the last week. But, you know, that doesn't really help us that much. So, obviously, you've had an election in Italy. There's a lot of pol pol political discussion. You think politics would be a huge, a huge issue in the way that people search. And it is quite big, but no bigger than Donald Trump, it turns out. 
So what I needed was something that was so big, it would put all of this into context. And this, uh, again, these are searches in Italy. And uh, I did find something, <laughs> which was... So it turns out, <laughs> turns out that's what people care about in Italy, which, is, which I could, anybody could have told you, I guess. But actually seeing it confirmed in search makes it interesting. So often when we're looking at search data, it's important not to just use it in isolation. If you look at one thing, you can say, oh, there's a 2,000% spike in searches for cauliflower pizza, say. It doesn't mean anything unless you can see where it really fits. And we're incredibly eclectic as people, right? We search for lots of things. We may search for Kim Kardashian, Donald Trump, and football in the same search query. You know, that's the amazing thing about it. It kind of gives you that window into the way people work. So we run a curation team. And my team basically is a mixture of different things. We create that, this kind of content, maps and visuals. If you're not following at Google Trends now, it's a good time to, to follow us. But we also work a lot with newsrooms. Say you're after that data set you can't get hold of. We'll try and track that down and work with you on interpreting it and, and visualizing it. And we also work a lot on thinking about how we can support data journalism as a whole. Often that's through tools. We also work on projects like um, Election Land. Does everybody know about Election Land? OK, so for anybody who doesn't, this was a project was with um, ProPublica. And the idea was to monitor on Election Day um, the problems that people have in terms of voting. Because every year, every time there's an election in the US, people say, oh, there's long lines in this state, but they can't find the, the voting station. So what if we could find those stories and then verify them? So this turned into the largest single-day collaborative reporting exercise in history. There's a 1,000 reporters gathered around the US and in this uh, reporting uh, center at CUNY in New York. And it became this amazing kind of resource of stories which looked at whether there were voting issues or the voting fraud issues, the way people vote and so on. Um, the, we, we did this live map of um, search terms that were spiking above average. So you can see this is a kind of recreation of election day in search terms for things like long wait times or provisional ballots, which is where you go in and you ask for a new voting uh, slip because you can't vote, or voter intimidation or voting machine problems, which did become an issue. So the idea is this would then be a signal for the journalist to go out and check these things are happening, find the voting station where it was going on, and really see if the story was, was true or not. And I think that's where this data can become really powerful because it can help people understand that. Um, we're now involved in this project, which is called Documenting Hate, which is again run with ProPublica. And the idea of Documenting Hate is that there is anecdotal evidence in the US that there, is increasing, um, case, that there are increasing cases of hate crime going on over time. But there's no real evidence. And the reason there's no real evidence is because there's no proper national data. States do not have to report hate crimes. So they don't. So the idea of documenting hate is to gather up those crimes into, into um, a database and create a proper database around these stories. And we've been thinking a lot about how we can, uh, we can support that, and I'll show you later on one of the projects we've done around that. The other thing we think about a lot is opening up the data and making it available. We have a GitHub page. We've also got a page on Kaggle. I don't know if anybody uses Kaggle in here. Can we use Kaggle? It's amazing. There's a million and a half data scientists on Kaggle. So we put our data on there as well. And the idea for that is that because trans data can seem weird sometimes and difficult to use, we want people to use it. I want people to go out and download one of these data sets and make their own visuals, better than our visuals, hopefully. Um, and that's there. And we, every day or every week, we'll put on new data sets on there for people to play with. It feels to me like, I mean, I've, I've talked about this a lot, but open data and open data journalism have always gone hand in hand. They're like two sides of the same coin as far as data journalism is concerned. There's no point being clever if you can't share what you're working on and share your data. Um, the other thing we've worked on, this is another project with ProPublica, is something called the election data bot. So in America, um, election boundaries are terribly confusing. There's like midterms happening in November. There's five, you know, all the, the House members that will be up, the Senate members that will be up. These are th thousands of counties and congressional district areas across the US. So the idea of the data bot is to gather all of that data into one place. So what we have there is spending data and polling data and deleted tweets and Facebook ads and 
Google news stories about each candidate, all kind of gathered into one place, and trending candidates, so you can see which candidate is being searched over somebody else. So the iris to make that data available, there's an, an amazing notification system they built into it, so you can see how people are searching and um, what's happening in each place. So the idea behind that is really kind of bringing all that data together and trying to make it more available. There's a lot of other challenges to being a data journalist, and one of which is that 80% of your work is quite boring because it's cleaning up messy data, dealing with all the, the, the merged cells and the, the ridiculousness in it. So I think about this a lot because I spend a lot of my time doing it. So one of the things we're doing is uh, we are finding a new development on OpenRefine. I know everybody here uses OpenRefine. OpenRefine is still the best way to clean up messy data. And because it's been run by the community, it was originally Google Refine, put out to the community, and we wanted to make, give them the space to develop that and add all the new things it needs. So there'll be an OpenRefine version 3.0, which will be launching sometime in the next few months. They'll have loads more improvements in it. It connects better with spreadsheets, connects better with bigger data sets. And again, it's about cleaning up data and making it easier for people to use. I'm going to give the translator a break for a second. The other thing we think a lot about is how you begin. So one of the things that working on the Data Journalism Awards shows me is how people are starting to get into data journalism everywhere around the world. It's not just here in Italy or Germany or the US or wherever. It's in Nigeria and Kenya and in the Philippines. It's happening all over the place. So we think a lot about how we can support that. So one of the things we're building is a data journalism curriculum. And the idea of that is to give people a starting place. I'm actually teaching as well. I'm teaching at um, the Medill School in a campus in San Francisco, and we're trying out a lot of this course in action. And the idea is all of these tools that I show you, there's little video courses and, and ways to start on that. We're also supporting, really happy to support the Data Journalism Handbook, um, which was last published in 2011. It's an amazing resource. Students use it all over the world. And um, you know, working with the EJC we're really and Jonathan and Liliana, who I don't know if are in here, you know, we're really happy to support that and make sure it's an incredible product, which I'm really happy that's going to be coming out again soon. We also think a lot about visualization. A lot of people confuse data journalism and visualization into to one thing. They think it's the same, the same thing, but visualization is obviously a crucial part of data journalism. So one of the things we've done is uh, funded this tool called Flourish. I think Duncan from Flourish is going to be here tomorrow. Is there anybody who hasn't heard of Flourish? OK. You've got to sign up for Flourish. You get a free, as a, but one thing we're doing is we're funding free accounts for journalists. And the thing about Flourish is what it allows people to do is they can upload any visualization to it, and then it can be reused again and again. Now, anybody who's not a coder, who's tried to persuade a developer to rebuild that visualization for the 14th time, will know how difficult that is. So what Flourish does is, is there are a ton of templates in there now. You can make these visuals without being a coder. You just upload your data, change the text, change the look of it, and you've got a new visualization which can be embedded or downloaded and embedded on your own site. And again, it's kind of, we want to, that to be open, so Anybody who doesn't wants a journalism account should sign up for it. Let them know you're a journalist because you'll get a free account and you'll be able to, to use that to create these incredible visuals. You don't have to be a coder, which is handy for me. I think we thought a lot about is about data viz. So a lot of companies make data visualizations. You know, this has become a big thing. So we thought, and the problem is they all start to look the same after a while. And frankly, it means they all end up looking like marketing exercises. So what we thought was, how can we use our budget for good? Right? How, can we use, how can we make stuff that actually is a good project? So what we decided to do was to work with great designers, people like Albert Cairo, Moritz Stefana, and Nadia Bremer, and Georgia Lupi, and Joaquin G.V. And the idea was to say to them, you can do what you want. We'll give you the budget. You can do what you want. The main things are it's got to be mobile first, and it's got to be open source so anybody can redo it and it's got to be doing something different. I'm going to show you some of the, some of the work we've done. Um, we've worked with We Do Data for the French election, where they were, they were taking search data and looking at issues that were associated with each candidate, which is a tricky data exercise. And um, we were then publishing that data online as, as a GitHub exercise. And we, basically, and we did it right at the beginning of the campaign, and when we got down to the two candidates, we just, just showed them. Moritz um, worked on this great project for the German election. 
He reinvented the word cloud, which is something that some people get really uh, anxious about, but I think he's done a really nice job on it. And the idea was, again, to use search data to kind of look at how people search for different candidates, the kind of issues, the things they associate with those candidates. And to find new ways of showing that data, we said to him, you know, you can do what you want as long as it's something different and everything has to be embeddable and open source and usable kind of again and again. And what was interesting in Germany was how closely it reflected what was going on in the campaign, how certain issues would flare up and you'd see them in the, in the data. We did a similar thing with uh, Georgia Lupi and the Accurate team for the US. And these were basically treating the US election as a world election because everybody cares about, about the US election around the world and look at the issues that people search for with, um, with different candidates. This is something that um, Nadia Bremer built. And what she wanted to look at was the words that people search for to translate into English in different languages. So if you speak Japanese, what words in English do you search for? If you speak French, what words in English do you search for? Um, and, is, and she made this incredibly beautiful exercise. It, it also shows you things that actually most of the th words that we search for are uh, quite boring. The things like days of the week or work or whatever, but seeing it across different nationalities is really a kind of a powerful thing. This was something we did with um, Moritz Stefana, and what he wanted to look at was the way that people search for food over time. So we have all this data, and food is, you know, that's how we all search for recipes, right? We all search for how to make stuff, how to buy stuff, what to do with it. But what he wanted to show was years and dates and months in one chart. Now, you could have done a load of little line charts, but there's something about trying to bring it together in this, in this particular visualization, which is really uh, beautiful. And it also has the benefit, unintentional benefit, that some of these charts look like food, <laughs> which was not intended. It kind of happened. Look at the, the gefilte fish and, and the pear and the donut. It's kind of an amazing thing. But you can see how there's things on donuts that you know, there's a scandal about, uh, about a pop star stealing a bunch of donuts from a bakery and that makes donut search or National Donut Day or whatever. And some of this is seasonal because of, you know, religious reasons or because of, of kind of food festivals. Again, because search reflects the way, that, the way that we live. This was something, this is still my favorite project, which is referred to internally as the toilet project. And the idea was that because we noticed there's a real spike in the way people search for how, how do I do something? And it turns out that we all do that, right? We all say, how do I fix this? How do I mend this thing that's broken in my life? So this was Jacques, Joaquin did this, who used to be um, graphics director at The Guardian. And he turned it into kind of a visual, a very visual essay. About, and it's, it's kind of an interesting, uh, gives an interesting sense of what people search for. So I don't know if you can see this, but these little pink dots, can you see the pink dots? They show the global average for how people search how to fix each thing. So in the UK, for instance, People are kind of on average for fixing washing machines and doors, uh, a little bit above global average for fixing the toilet, under for fixing windows, crazy high above it for fixing light bulbs. I, think, I, th I actually think, now that I don't live in the UK, that people in the UK are obsessed with light bulbs and getting to work because they haven't had eco light bulbs for a while. But it's different in different countries. So in France, people are fine with their light bulbs, but washing machines are obviously causing trouble on windows. Look at windows, they're way above. Global average, and sinks, look at sinks way above global average. But in Italy, doors are under, windows a bit over, toilets are on average, washing machines. Why is this Italian washing machines? Is this a thing? It's, see, <laughs> I don't know, I want to know about Italian washing machines now, I understand why. And fridges, refrigerators and washing machines seem to be a big thing. So again, it's kind of like when he did this, all the data's online, it's open source, but it's kind of fun as well. And I think, you know, we all know that visualizations increasingly, we need to think about who we're speaking to when we make visualizations. Are we speaking to people like us? Or are we speaking to the rest of the world? Or do we want our parents to, and our grandparents to understand what we're doing, or do we just want our colleagues to understand? And that feels to me like a key thing when you're visualizing anything. So we've done some other tools as well. This is something called Tilegrams, which makes cartograms. So we, we noticed before the last election, there was a, lot, a real increase in people making cartograms, you know, maps that don't look like maps. And they're difficult to do. So, for instance, I, 5.30, I think, used Illustrator to make their cartograms every day, which felt like that's, there must be a better way to do this, right? So um, we built this with a team called Pitch in Oakland. And what it does 
It's, it's on GitHub. It's just a really quick tool to make a cartogram. You can make any country. There are some templates on there for um, major kind of countries and their electorates. You can make and you can make your own. You can download it either as an SVG or as a, to, as a JSON file to, to, to embed or upload. And we're starting to think ahead now. Like, what's it going to look like next year? What do we do next year that's different? So we've started to focus more on less on kind of our data and more on innovation. So, for instance, generative art is you know the kind of, is one of those things that people have started to get into, but it's really hard to do. It's really hard to do without being a developer. So, how do you make that? So, we're working with Datavised, who are based in New York, and we're going to build a tool that anybody can upload their own data set and make a piece of generative art. And then we're going to do the same thing with sonification. Like, what would data sound like? If you can make a data set sound like something, what would it sound like? And how would you do that? How do you make a tool that anybody can then use to upload their own data? So the idea is really here, it's about thinking, you know, a lot of newsrooms don't have the, the time to explore as much as they might want to. So we do have that. So what can we do that's then useful for people to, to use and use again? We thought a lot about data journalism on mobile. So, for instance, we have AMP, you know, which is, the, is a great mobile platform. It doesn't work so well with data journalism, and there's a whole project internally to, to improve that. We've also got this tool called the Data Gift Maker. Um, this was something we used internally because we often want to compare two things and see how they change over time. And uh, so now we made it so anybody can upload it, their own data and use it again. You download a GIF because it's amazing. As visualization has become more sophisticated, the visuals that most of us share out there in the world have become less sophisticated because we consume stuff on mobile. Was it now that 50% of news is consumed on mobile in most countries now? And, and some countries like in Asia, it's all on mobile. So a lot of visualizations don't work. So we're thinking a lot about GIFs, and we're going to add some new uh, things to that as well. So the other things we think a lot about are AR and VR. You know, these are kind of things which are incredibly powerful for newsrooms and they're incredibly powerful visual tools, but they're not straightforward to use often. They're kind of dif difficult and tricky. I first started thinking about this during Brexit. So we did this visual which showed the questions that people ask in different EU countries about Brexit, just ahead of the, the vote. And it's kind of 3D-ish. So what if we turn that into a VR data viz? So we worked with um, Pitch Interactive in Oakland to do that, and taught me lots of things about making visuals in VR one of which is that people can actually get physically sick with VR. Has anybody experienced this? It's a real thing. Like, if you haven't got somewhere to stand on or somewhere that's below you, you can actually feel sick. And the other thing I learned is that you can't put much content on because you can't read a lot. If it's like this, you're not going to read a massive paragraph of text or see a load of numbers. So we sprinted on this. We did it in two weeks. And it taught us all this stuff about making a VR visual, but it's still the thing, well, we should make that process easier for people to use. So we've added these templates to um, Flourish, now where you can make a VR network chart. Use, and this, this just shows the way that people search for TV shows and what else they search for, search for a TV show. You can do it with anything you want to do. So that's on Flourish now, and, it says, and there are a couple of templates on there for people to use and play with. All you need is the data. You don't have to be a coder or a kind of VR designer. You can get that, and you're creating a VR visual with any data you want. And we're going to do the same kind of thing with AR. So we're working with Acura on a AR tool which will open source um, as a way to... They're thinking a lot around the idea of hope. What are people hopeful for? What do we care about? Because everything is so miserable at the moment. We thought we should try and feel hopeful. And um, the idea of the visual is you say what you're hopeful for, and you create the shape which you then place somewhere. Other people place theirs around too, and you can find them. It's kind of, it's going to be great. But the idea is when we do something like that, again, is to make it open source and write about how we do it so people understand what the point is and how to use AR in a kind of informational or data viz context. We thought a lot also about AI. Google is uh, obsessed with AI as, as a company, and it's something we think, well, how can we use AI in the newsroom? And so there are journalists out there who've been doing this. Peter Aldous at BuzzFeed has done some amazing projects using AI in looking at spy planes and videos and so on. So one of the things we're thinking about is creating these kind of very simple tools. Oh, I'm going to run out of time. Simple tools around artificial intelligence newsrooms. So we've been building little tools, and partly this is proof of concept. So we've just made one, which we're trialing with the Washington Post and Hearst, which is using 
the Google Language API to create a tool for transcribing audio and video files. So I've spent years of my life transcribing interviews. What if I could get a computer to do it for me? So that's the idea of that tool, but it's partly just to show if it's possible, and then we'll show how we did that. We've also, I talked a bit before about documenting hate. So this is a project we've built for documenting hate, and what that does, that takes all the news articles around hate crimes and starts to categorize them. So Google, Google News, when you look at Google News, has a set of articles. Most of the ones you see are from trusted sources, big news outlets. But for stories around hate crime, we wanted the small news outlets. We wanted the news paper in the middle of Oregon that might have a story about something. So that's what this project does. We take all of those stories, there's about 8,000 in there now, and we use the Natural Language Processing API to read through them all and categorize them. So then it becomes more of a tip-off sheet. A reporter can then use that to check out some of these stories and, and see how they work. Um, talk really quickly about Data Journalism Awards. It's a really important thing for us. Marianne's happy there. Um, we're going to announce a shortlist tomorrow at the Data Journalism Month conference. So you can find out who's, who's up for, a, for an award. It's an incredible shortlist this year. I'm uh, really excited about it. I think it's going to be really good. And what's impressive to me is how many of those really incredible entries have come from around the world, not just from the big newsrooms, not just from the ones you might expect. So that's, that's it for me. This is what we do. I've got like 10 minutes, I think, before we get thrown out for questions. Um, I just want to give you guys a sense of what we're, what we're doing. I'm going to get my headphones so I can understand, but yeah. Hi, you have one. Hi. I think there's a microphone. Is there a microphone? I can ask you the question and you can keep it. Okay, sure, great. very practical and maybe naive questions. Okay. Um, let's say I'm just a journalist and uh, I'm not in newsroom. Uh, could I just write to Google Trends and say, hey Google Trends, uh, I'd like to publish a story, I don't know about the Italian election and Google searches. Could you help me out with that? So you could use, I mean, Google Trends as a tool has got a lot of like local filters. You could filter down to regions within Italy. You actually wouldn't need us for a lot of it. I think you could do a lot of stuff around how people are searching, major search terms, candidates without us. But yeah, we have, we often, we get people in coming to us all the time and we want to help. So we'll help as much as we can, but often what we'll try and do is say, you can use this tool for yourself and it's super easy to use. And if you want to ask me at the end, I'll show you some things. Sorry, I probably should have done a bit of that today, but. Any other questions? Yeah. So are most of these tools uh, free just for journalists? Yeah. All right. Absolutely. So if you're not a journalist, you don't get access to that? Mm, um, most of them, I, most of the things like Tilegrams, you know, Flourish, you can access Flourish without being a journalist. You get a different account, you're a journalist. But most, you know, most of the, you know, are what we're thinking about is journalism. Doesn't mean you can't use the tools. You want to make a data GIF, go right ahead. It's, uh, it's out there and they're free and they're open source. We're, we're trying to put as few barriers in there as possible. So you ask for it? <laughs> no, well, some of them are just open. You just go and use them. You don't need to ask for it at all. But I think Flourish, you have to sign up for it, but yeah. I was just wondering if the amount of information that is available is is the same everywhere in the world. For instance, I'm I work in the Middle East and I'm based there, so I'm thinking language barriers. How does mm. it work? So what you'll find is in some countries there's just less uh, search interest, and that, that affects the data. But so and what I find is you can normally get something from everywhere. There are some countries where you know Google's not present, right, and there, there's nothing we can do about that. But in countries where it is, often you know, is using those big search terms and comparing what you're doing to those big search terms can help. You'll normally find people always search for football, say. Yeah, you can normally find and use that as a way to work out how big searches are. So, but we've got, I mean, that's what the, the Trends tool has got 200 odd countries on there. So it has data down to a regional and even city level for those countries. So there's a lot of information there. Yeah, you should be able to find stuff. Uh, the, the, you know, those sites say if you're in a Middle Eastern country, and then it would the searches would come back in Arabic anyway. So, 
Hi Simon, I'm John Goodell from the BJTC, the Broadcast hey. Journalism Training Council in the UK. Uh, we have about 4,000 students um, training as journalists at the moment yeah. in the UK. You talked about the data module, uh, the data curriculum that you're yeah. developing. Are you looking at uh, extending that uh, into, into other parts of the world and, and what will the process be? Yeah, so we work, there is a, uh, a Google News Lab University network. I don't know if you guys are part of that, I hope so. Yeah. Um, but then there's already access to a lot of training materials there. We've got videos online, as they are right now, and we're just working on this curriculum at the moment. We're hoping to spread that out to everybody. It should be open to anybody. We don't want to put any barriers in the way of that either. Um, hello, I work for School of Data, and I'm interested in knowing if you work also with um, more NGOs and CSOs who do ju journalism work without being newsrooms. Yeah, a lot of the entries we have to the Data Journalism Awards for, from NGOs. And uh, yeah, there's some amazing work going on. Absolutely. When certainly, you know, we might partner up with an NGO to produce a piece of content, say, or visualizations. We did that with the um, American Society of News Paper Editors. We did a visualization showing diversity in newsrooms over time and how that's changed. We worked on the the, the Open News uh, News Nerd Survey and the ICFJ stuff. And we tend to focus stuff that's around journalism. But sometimes, if it's a big topic that's of interest to journalists, we'll we'll cooperate on that as well. I think there's one here. Oh, in the front as well. Sorry. Hi, Simon. Hi. Is there any plan uh, to launch like a car tool, like tool, like you know how Google Maps is powerful? We actually, we tool. actually use we actually use Carto, but I mean Google you Maps. You use it, but you know. yeah, I use it. My <laughs> team uses it, but we use Google Maps on Carto. We just use it for the interface. Um, I really like Carto. I'm a big fan of it. I think you know Google Maps. I know is always developing. There's a lot of right now. You've got Fusion Tables and My Maps and Google Maps. There's a lot of tools there, so I think we're having a lot of discussions about how that looks in the future. But right now, I don't have anything to report, I'm afraid. But, but we will do, I'm sure, in the, in the near future. I think there's one at the front, sorry. Hi, you said it's free for journalists. How would you assess who's a journalist and who's not? I mean, like, do you ask for accreditation or also freelancers could? So we leave that up to, do you mean the Flourish tool? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we leave that up to Kiln, who runs that. But um, you, you, when you sign up for Flourish, if you go on there, there's a category that says Newsroom, and you just have to say where you work, I think. But um, yeah, they run that, because yeah, we're a small team. What if you work freelance and don't have a company email address? Sorry? What if you work freelance and don't have a company email I don't think it matters. We let you know, freelancers can join up as well, I think. It doesn't have, just have to be big newsrooms. And there's one at the back, I think. Hi, Stuart Lau from the Reuters Institute. May I know how AI could be deployed by journalism future. What's your view of how it can actually happen in journalism? Thank you. So we've um, we've we've come up with actually we brainstormed we thought about a lot about this and we came up with four things that we want to build. So one of which is a transcription tool. I mentioned that I think transcribing audio video, boring task but really important and seems like a natural. And the tests we've done so far have been really encouraging, like incre like a lot of accuracy and speed like uh, it takes we, we, we you view, it takes about 20% a, a of the time the length of the file to transcribe it which imagine if we could get that to words that would be great we think a lot of, i think content classification like we have you know we we have a ton of content how can that be classified and exploration if you you know when you're doing a big research job if you have thousands of articles the stuff we did with documenting hey i think classifying those articles by subject and topic is really really important i think image recognition you know, recognizing images, having, you know, photographs from a news event, a big crowd of people finding images, and I think that could be a really powerful use as well. So I think even if those things happen, that would be revolutionary for a lot of newsrooms. So it's definitely where we're going, and, uh, you know, anything we can do to support that is going to be really important, I think. Okay, anything else? Great. Okay, thank you guys. Thanks so much. I'm, I'll be here for a little bit if anybody has any questions, but thank you so much for coming.